Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for our third federal and state resource series with the HUD, with HUD, and also with GoBiz. We're going to start off this morning with some brief welcomes and introductions from Ed Cabrera, who is with our San Francisco office, and he is the field director there. And we're going to also have some opening remarks from Mark Polimus who is with GoBiz. After those brief introductions, we'll transition to an opportunity for our, our promise zones to introduce themselves. And during that introductory period to give us an update on some of the things that they're excited about that are occurring right now in their promise zone. Today, we're gonna focus on supporting underserved communities, economic opportunities, by, and economic opportunities and addressing, eliminating the digital divide. So I'm gonna pass this on to Ed Cabrera. Thank you so much, Danette. Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me all right? We can hear you. Great, thank you. Just wanted to welcome you all to the Federal and State Resource Series for California Promise Zones. And as Danette mentioned, this is brought to you by HUD in the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development. First, I'd like to just briefly formally introduce myself. I'm Ed Cabrera. I'm the San Francisco Field Office Director for Northern California. And I'm excited to join you all for today's panel. I wanna also thank the California Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development for helping us provide this series. I've appreciated their partnership in this work, uh, and I want to especially thank Mark Palimas, uh, Raquel Aparicio, uh, and uh, all partners for helping plan and coordinate today's meeting. Uh, our goal today is to increase your awareness and access to federal and state resources to better support underserved communities across the state. Our panelists will share information about their agency's resources to improve access to internet and technology to build infrastructure, and to address the wealth gap that disproportionately impacts the communities we serve. I want to thank our colleagues uh, from federal and state agencies uh, who are participating in today's convening. For those of you who may not be as familiar with Promise Zones, HUD Region 9 is honored to support four of the 12 Promise Zones designated by HUD. Uh, and today we welcome uh, all of them, the Los Angeles Promise Zone, the Sacramento Promise Zone, uh, San Diego Promise Zone, and Slate Z, or the South Los Angeles Transit Empowerment Zone, to the convening. Uh, through the Promise Zone Place Space Initiative, we're committed to working strategically in Los Angeles, San Diego, Sacramento, and South LA communities to boost economic activity and job growth, uh, to improve educational opportunities, improve public safety, uh, educational opportunities, and leverage public and private investments to improve residents' quality of life. I'd also like to acknowledge and thank Zahira Mann, Julius Austin, Xiomales Crespo, and Elder Sanabria for leading our Promise Zones. We value the critical work your organizations and community partners are doing to advance sustainable community solutions and equitable community development. We're committed to providing support and assistance to help your Promise Zones achieve the objectives of their designation. We realize that segregation, economic divestment, and underinvestment uh, left Promise Zone communities grappling with numerous challenges that have been exacerbated over the last couple of years. So gaining access to the unprecedented, unprecedented number of federal resources that are in the pipeline remains crucial to our mission here at HUD. We know that addressing the needs of underserved communities is challenging, but together we can do our part to provide our communities with as many essential resources and services to improve their quality of life. Our session today addresses HUD's fiscal year 2022 through 2026 strategic plan goal of supporting underserved communities to fortify support for underserved communities and support equitable community development for all people. Our federal and state panelists will share their funding opportunities, technical assistance and resources, and you're uniquely positioned to build collaborations 
that can utilize these resources in the promise zones. We encourage you to reach out to our panelists following this convening to learn more about the resources they offer to support underserved communities. Your HUD community liaison is available to arrange these follow-up discussions with our federal and state agency partners. Again, thank you for your work and joining us for today's convening. I'm now going to pass it over to Mark Polimus to provide some remarks on behalf of GoBiz. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ed. Um, I'm gonna keep this nice and brief. Uh, first off, I'd like to thank HUD um, for the continued partnership and working with GoBiz in providing or preparing these uh, convenings that we could share state and federal resources so that our Promise Zone communities can leverage as uh, leverage the maximum amount they can to be able to achieve community and economic development goals within their communities. Um, I'd like to take the time to introduce a couple of new members that GoBiz has on our team so that we can continue our support for these communities. I'd like to welcome uh, Chris Castorena out of the Los Angeles area. He is going to be our economic recovery coordinator for Los Angeles County, and he can be available to Slate Z as well as the Los Angeles Promise Zone and ensuring that they are invited to the surf tables within their communities. Also, Steven Sutterman of Sacramento, he will be available to the Sacramento Promise Zone and ensuring that Sacramento Promise Zone and their partner organizations are represented in the surf tables as well. And as we all um, have been introduced to before, Raquel Aparicio out of San Diego and ensuring the San Diego Promise Zone is included. Uh, we have an exciting panel of state government or state representatives from the Department of Toxic Substances Control to talk about Brownfields revitalization. We have representatives from the California Department of Technology to talk about broad broadband for all in the digital equity uh, plan. And we have representative from uh, GoBiz who will be talking about the um, community, uh, talking about community grants that have been created out of um, recent the recreational marijuana legalization legislation and sales tax revenues that generated by that go back to communities that have been impacted by the war on drugs. So with that, I'd like to turn it over to my federal partners in um, running the, the panel, or sorry, to, to turn it over to our Promise Zone communities to talk about what they've been working on recent and what they have planned for the next year. Go ahead and start with our our um, partners in Sacramento and work our way down to um, San Diego. So we'll go with Sacramento, Los Angeles, Slate Z, and then San Diego. Hello, everyone. My name is Julius Austin. I am the manager of the Sacramento Promise Zone, uh, and I work for the lead agency of our Promise Zone, which is Sacramento Housing and Redevelopment Agency. I uh, joined here today uh, by my colleague, Algie Mosley, who is the Sacramento Promise Zone Coordinator. Um, we are super excited, uh, you know, to continue our partnership with both GoBiz and with HUD. Um, and we are super excited about a few projects. I don't know how much time I have. Uh, Danette, how much time do I have? You know, We're I, I asking that you each keep your remarks to two to three minutes. Perfect, Thank you. I, you know, I could talk about the Promise Zone for hours. I'm glad. I appreciate that. <laughs> I appreciate you asking. <laughs> All right. So uh, I'll just name a couple of things. We're super excited, kind of in the in the education space. Uh, super excited about our Sacramento Promise Zone Literacy Initiative, which we partnered with the Sacramento Literacy Foundation to do three things. One, get books into the hands and homes of children. Uh, we have been able to distribute 50,000 books. I'll say that again, 50,000 books to kids, which is super exciting. Every child who is in kindergarten through second grade uh, in 20 different Promise Zone schools uh, have received the books. Uh, the first year we did 30,000 books and each kid got uh, five to six books. And um, uh, we worked in partnership with the school district and community-based organizations and volunteers to distribute those books to each household during the, and it was during the pandemic, of course. Uh, and then the second year we recognize is super important for the kids that we have 
to be able to see themselves in the books that they read. And so uh, the second year we were super intentional about making sure that we had culturally diverse books um, provided to all uh, of the kids. So this impacts uh, about 4,000 kids. So we're super excited about that. Um, we also provide um, uh, grants to literacy serving organizations to do literacy interventions and programs. So that affects hundreds of other kids. Um, I'm excited about our financial institution collaborative, which we've partnered with the FDIC and the Federal Reserve to convene all of the banks in the region to uh, pursue collaborative efforts uh, and their CRA giving. And we are fortunate that we've had six rounds. Uh, $905,000 have been distributed to community-based organizations that uh, serve the Prime Zone area and uh, projects that are related to either uh, housing, uh, workforce development, um, and education as well. And so we've been able to impact 39 community-based organizations uh, with nine different projects with that. And uh, on October 25th, I'll be reconvening uh, the banks to prepare for round seven. Also excited about a broadband project. We've been able to um, do a pilot that provided uh, free Wi-Fi to students who and families who were in our public housing space. Uh, 25 uh, individuals were chosen for uh, the pilot, but we have uh, had a really successful pilot. And now we're looking to create infrastructure that would provide access to free Wi-Fi for two public housing units, uh, over 700 households, and also would provide free Wi-Fi access to the two schools that are close by the public housing units, which is an elementary school and also help professional high school. So I'll stop there because like I said, I can say much more, but uh, those are just a couple of the things we're excited about. Wonderful, thank you, Julius. Let's move on to Los Angeles. Thank you, thank you, Danette. Um, and, and once again, also wanna reiterate um, Julius's point about continuing this partnership with um, with GoBiz and, and with our California Promise Zones and, and of course, both of our HUD field offices. Um, and so, yeah, I, again, you know, I don't think we'd have to do a whole full uh, blown Promise Zone overview, but I think, you know, in terms of what we're really excited about, uh, one of the things that I've been repeatedly talking about to a lot of our, our partners um, is really, you know, the California for All funding that we received um, several, several months ago, um, probably at the end of last year was around $53 million to to develop a number more well over a dozen maybe 13 um, youth workforce development programs uh, many of you who, who've been familiar with our with our promise zone uh, have known that education has always been our, our primary focus um, um, but over the last couple of years particularly as it pertained to responding to the pandemic and thinking about what our families are going through we realized that we needed to really really kind of emphasize and focus a lot of our energies in this workforce aspect too and particularly as it pertained to young Angelina knows here um, in the city. And so one of the things that we've been working on is how do we continue to you know, take advantage and leverage this funding that we're receiving to amplify the opportunities for young people that are vulnerable, that are in the vulnerable populations, whether it's folks that are disconnected or in the foster program or justice involved, whatever it is, um, making sure that we're targeting those communities with a very specific emphasis on promosomes um, and making sure that we're either being host sites. We have over 40 organizations that are not that are nonprofits with us um, that are supporting either being host sites for what we're calling the Angelina no core program, which is similar to the AmeriCorps. So obviously, Promisons here are familiar with AmeriCorps. Uh, we've created a, a localized version of the same thing. And kind of obviously, one of the things that I'm really excited about is being able to kind of take successes and pilot things that um, we ourselves have been able to be at the center of the innovation for. And so I think over the next couple of months and, and well into the next year, as we think about sustainability, as we think about all the different things that our Promisone is particularly interested in, um, taking advantage of these types of opportunities, I think is gonna be one of our primary focuses. And I think that um, what's really exciting about today is, is being able to hear again, once again, really, really appreciate these opportunities to hear from different folks in, 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 in the state um, and at the federal level to kind of open some, some other windows and doors of opportunity for us to be able to engage in. So with that, um, thank you for the, for the time and uh, looking forward to today. 
Fantastic. We're going to go ahead and move on to Slate Z. And I believe Michael Diaz will be representing them today. Oops, sorry, I was muted. Uh, yeah, like everyone else, thank you, Danette. Like everyone else said, um, yeah, really happy to be here. Really happy to continue this partnership with uh, GoBiz and um, HUD and uh, just really happy to be here with, uh, with everyone and just hear all the amazing things that uh, everyone has been doing in their um, respective promise zones in the state and also with the help of the federal, federal level. Um, yeah, uh, some things we're excited for in, uh, in Slate Z is, um, um, the TCC grant that was uh, announced uh, yesterday um, for South LA, South LA Ecolab. It's a community-driven project proposal and seeks to secure uh, about $35 million in funding from the California Strategic Growth Council. And it's going to implement uh, economic development through climate action in a, in a 3.9 mile area in South Los Angeles. And I'm in South LA, so that's just like a, just a huge thing. You know, I'm, I'm 20 years old and just seeing all this, um, being at, at, you know, in, in this position, being able to actually see the, uh, the action of uh, all these different um, projects and uh, community-based organizations, it's a, it's, a, it's a really great sight to see and um, really happy to see how it moves forward throughout the next year and just seeing all the great projects like uh, South LA, stress-free streets, cool pavement, cool roofs, just excited to see, uh, all um, like my community get all these resources that they just, like they really deserve. So I'm really happy for that. Thank you. And we'll conclude with our um, partners in San Diego. And congratulations, Lacey. Good morning, everyone. My name is Siomalis Crespo. I go by Seal. I am the Promise Zone and Special Projects Manager at the Cities of San Diego Economic Development Department, which is the backbone organization of our Promise Zone. And we're really excited about a, several different things that we're working on concurrently. So um, we will be um, allocating a specific amount of funding for distributing microgrants to small businesses within the Promise Zone through a small business enhancement program. And the rollout of that program will actually be by the end of this calendar year. We'll be working with our partners to um, match your small businesses to um, small business assistance providers so that they're able to really get the support and you know supplemental assistance that they need as part of this effort. Um, we are also continuing to work on our public-private partnerships as it relates to our corporate partnerships and um, how um, corporate giving and how philanthropic dollars are actually coming into the Promise Zone as a way to get around some of the barriers that grant funding opportunities um, unfortunately still pose to some of our partners with um, challenges to capacity. So we will continue to get creative about, around ways to facilitate those connections and and then to really expand the capacity of our partners to do what they do boots on the ground. Um, I'm particularly excited in November, we'll actually be hosting a town hall on housing affordability and we'll have um, the regional administrator for HUD, actually Jason Pugh, be part of that um, meeting. So I'll be happy to share more details um, once we do have them. And um, we also continue just, you know, for this group's knowledge to work on um, our collaboration with the Department of IT as it relates to SD Access for All which is the city of San Diego's um, digital equity initiative. Um, there are digital literacy um, components of this, digital access and connectivity, and then also creating a safe space for folks to be able to access all, all of these resources. So we will continue to work with them on long-term broadband planning efforts. Um, last but not least, we do have sustainability in the mind. Um, this is year six of our promise, and we wanna make sure that we codify all of this amazing collaboration that has really moved us forward um, beyond the 10 year point of the designation. So I really look forward to continue to work with, um, you know, GOBIS and HUD to really create a blueprint of what that can look like. Thank you. Thank you so much, everyone. It is so exciting to hear the wonderful work that is moving forward in each of our promise zones. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Michael Huff, to introduce our first panel, we'll, which will present federal resources. Thank you, Danette. And uh, thank you to all of our attendees and um, our federal partners, our state partners, our Promise Zone partners. Really appreciate you being here today. And um, we have a, a, I think we have the partners as far as the federal level that align nicely with a lot of the, the things and projects that um, we've heard you mention that you're working on. 
um, we actually have um, partners who, as Ed mentioned, um, who are focused on HUD and, and aligned with HUD strategic goals um, and, and two specific goals. Um, strategic goal number one is support underserved communities. And that's what we're doing as we're doing these, these uh, events with the Promise Zone and our partners, you'll see. And then the second one is actually strategic goal number four, which is advanced sustainable communities. And some of the things we're going to be talking about today, the resources from the federal and state level will actually en enable that and facilitate that. So today we actually have, oh, let me just mention, I'm Michael Huff and I'm with HUD. Um, I'm in San Francisco office, out of the regional office. I'm the community liaison. I serve with the uh, Sacramento Promise Zone. We have working with us today and presenting from the EDA, we have Melinda Matson. She's the economic development representative for Northern and Coastal California for the uh, Economic Development Administration. And her area specifically is under Department of Labor, Employment and Training Administration. And then we also have presenting for us, we have um, Knowledge Build Hudson, and he is a representative from the National Telecommunication Information uh, Administration, NTIA, and it ties into obviously the broadband we're talking about. He works specifically with digital equity. And so those are the two um, partners that we'll be having uh, questions from and uh, getting resources and information from today. So without further ado, let me launch right in and start with our first question which is going to Melinda at the EDA. Melinda, could you provide us with kind of an update on any funding opportunities that your agency has coming, coming out? Okay. Oh, thank you. Um, first, I think there was a little bit of an error. I don't work for Department of Labor. I work for Department of Commerce, just like my colleague. Um, so I work with the Economic Development Administration. That's part of Department of, okay, very good. <laughs> a lot of Federal names are very alike, yes. Um, so, um, uh, you know, it is the beginning of our fiscal year, federal fiscal year, just a couple of weeks ago. And uh, we are all waiting for um, our uh, budget for this year. Um, so we're not, we are not quite sure how much that's going to be. Uh, we have just completed uh, uh, all of our CARES Act and ARPA money. And uh, what we're waiting for not only is a new appropriation, but uh, our uh, existing NOFO for our regular programs, uh, which we have been util utilizing our Public Works and Economic Adjustment Assistance, PWEAA 2020, uh, for several years now. And we are expecting a new NOFO to come out, and that's a Notice of Funding Opportunity. I apologize for the acronyms. Uh, we're expecting uh, a new one to come out somewhere between January and March. But regardless, we still are using, again, like I said, the PUIA 2020, it is still active and we are accepting applications. Um, and uh, the, there are three of us here in California and all of us are available to help um, develop applications, develop projects and advise on the, the applications. You can find all of our contact information on our website, eda.gov, um, or maybe Michael, we can provide it later. Um, my colleague, Will Marshall, covers Southern California, and uh, I cover the Sacramento area. Uh, the uh, only other NOFO that we are expecting at, and again, I don't know the exact timing of it, but it is for our Build to Scale program. And this is a program that is really focused on entrepreneurship and moving uh, businesses from concept uh, to the marketplace. So that's, that's pretty much for us what we have going on. So thank you. Thank you very much, Melinda. Um, sorry about the mix up. I don't know how I had Department of Labor in there or, or maybe that was a test. I don't know, I'm joking. Um, Let's go ahead to the next question for Knowledge Build uh, with the NTIA. Um, could you provide us with information on the Digital Equity Competitive Grant Program? Sure, good morning, everyone. 
So the Digital Equity Competitive Grant Program um, has not began yet, actually. <clears throat> so just for context, there's under the President Biden's um, infrastructure, bipartisan infrastructure law, there was a 40, there was four programs that came out of that with the intention of connecting all Americans to the internet, right? So 42, 42.5 billion was supposed to go for BEAD, which is the Broadband Equity Access and Development Program, which is with the intention of helping make sure that people have high speed, reliable internet services all, for all across America. And uh, then there was the Digital Equity Planning Capacity and Competitive Grants, which is speaking about, which, which is about $2.75 billion with the intention of addressing hard, the hard reality that most Americans can't be live with, you know, economic mobility, they can't have access to workforce, they can't without having access to the internet, right? Or devices, high speed devices, things like that, right? I think Julius was speaking about that earlier, all the work you guys are doing up there, which I really want to salute that um, and all the work you guys are doing. So what we're going to be doing is we're going to, we've already began awarding the planning grants well, we, or should I say, we, we received the grants and we'll, we'll be starting to award these grants very soon. But it's about maybe about a year out before the, the competitive grants will actually start to take place. So what we're encouraging people to do is get in tune with the state broadband offices, right? So in every state, there's a state broadband office and the state broadband office is responsible for developing a, a, a year plan. And so they get some monies to do this plan and about 12 months down the line, that's when they'll start to do the implementation. And that's where you have this competitive grants that will take place that can go to institutions and agencies such as yours or the ones that you work with. Um, but we need all, all voices to be heard. So, and we also encourage people to have a seat at the table. So that's why this is a great time to have this conversation because although the mice will not be awarded quite yet for this competitive grant processes, but you being at the table will allow them to know, them being the state broadband office, to know that you exist the work that you're doing to close the digital divide and to, for your voices and the, and the folks that you're working with's voices to be heard on what's the problem and how to solve the problems. So to ensure that people all across California are connected. So I hope that's helpful. But I mean, I have some of the resources and websites that I can give you more information too. Thank you very much, Knowledge Build. Um, and for our next question, I want to go ahead and pivot back to uh, Melinda. Um, Melinda, um, can you give us a little bit more, um, maybe some examples? You mentioned built to scale, and um, we're just wondering if there are any examples of projects that have been awarded. So, <laughs> um, actually, most recently, we just announced uh, the most recent round of uh, awards uh, for built to scale and uh, uh, actually, Southern California, uh, I believe there was one in San Diego, one in Los Angeles. I don't really know those much about that much about them. Uh, but we also awarded a, a grant to um, uh, the organization Chico Start up uh, in Chico. Uh, and they're focused on building uh, for this particular award uh, entrepreneurship in rural settings. Um, so entrepreneurship is one of our big uh, priorities. Um, and, uh, you know, one of the things that we look forward to, you know, in supporting entrepreneurship is, you know, supporting business incubators, business accelerators, business assistance programs uh, that focus on startups. Um, we do have a very successful project here in the Sacramento area that got its um, uh, start from um, the build to scale precursor. Um, it, its actual name is Ag Start. It's up in uh, Woodland. And this project um, supports entrepreneurs. It also has wet labs. It has its uh, focused on, um, so when a, a, an entrepreneur has a, a new product or a, is, is developing a product that has the ability to help uh, uh, through proof of concept and proof of market and actually help that business get to the market and be successful. So those are, uh, the whole program built to scale is focused upon that process of working startups especially those that have like new products and new uh, uh, processes. 
uh, getting them uh, scaled up and ready for market and then moving through the market to be growing and accelerating, expanding. Did I, did I hit it? <laughs> it's a hard question. <laughs> Really appreciate it. Uh, appreciate you going into the detail. That's de definitely very helpful. Um, let's go ahead and uh, move over to move back to Knowledge Build and the NTIA. And this would, um, you mentioned some things um, earlier, but I guess the question would be um, I guess looking at the, we have a question in the chat. Let's see, am I using those yet? Oh, I'm not using those yet, but we will. Um, so I wanted to ask you, what are the, can you share some examples of projects as well with the NTIA that may have been um, developed or funded? Sure, so um, at this time, so there's been one state that has received the, both the BEAD, which is the broadband deployment, um, equity, equity and deployment monies, as well as the digital equity monies. And that was uh, Louisiana. And they received about $3 million a couple of months ago. So they have $2 million for their, for their B planning and now they have $40,000 for their digital equity planning. Now see, part of this is that they haven't spent any of the money from my understanding quite yet because there's still, have, you know, states have to go through procurement to be able to bring someone on and start spending funds and things like that. So although they've been awarded, they're still working to be able to start the process of planning. Now they have about a year to do the digital equity plan specifically, right? And the plan is where you really do with the engagement. It's a part of the law to engage communities. And the eight core communities um, that we're trying to cover are the, our eight cover populations are the underserved. I'm going to pull it up so I can tell you exactly. <laughs> um, so it's low income households, aging populations, incarcerated individuals, veterans, people with disabilities, people with language barriers, racial and ethnic minorities, and rural inhabitants. So, um, and, and, that's, and that's under the digital equity. And the, the bead, it's like the underserved and the unserved and underserved, meaning people who do not have a connect, connection to high-speed internet, which is 100 megabytes download and 20 upload. Maybe that's for advice. So, yeah, download, upload, 120. I said to say that we're all working with people that are under those cover populations. So the goal is that you get the voice of the people to end the plan, right? So they have to deal with some stakeholder engagement, engaging, um, engaging uh, community-based organizations, municipal governments, and this is all throughout the state, right? And even when you're dealing with rural inhabitants, things like that. So electric companies who are doing broadband stuff. So all these people have to be a part of this plan. So over the next year, we'll be they'll be doing planning. And my responsibility as a digital equity advisor, I'm responsible for for 15 states in the northern plains and in the southwestern region. So Louisiana is one of my states. So I'm sort of waiting for them to bring the state broadband office on board and then, you know, move forward with their planning process. And so when you when when California is awarded the funds, the key will be to connect with the state broadband office. And I can help ensure that you all know who those per persons are. There's a regional director um, that there's a there's a regional director as well as a person who's just like me, which is the digital equity advisor in California, whose responsibility will be to come and work with you guys to ensure that you're a part of the plan. So as far as specifics, what we've funded as of yet, th so there has, there's only been the planning process that has been funded. But again, after a year, that's when you have those competitive grants where the money can go to anchor institutions and they can go to, uh, there's competitive grants and then there's also another grant process that can go to like individuals who are doing the work. So, but like I said, I'll share a link to make sure you have the information and I'll make myself available throughout this whole process to make sure that no one's left behind. That's perfect. Thank you so much, Knowledge Bill. That that you know, um, you know, I think that aligns with a lot of the needs that we're seeing across California. And um, fortunately, we do have the the state equity team um, from GoBiz on the line as well for this call. Um, I wanted to now pass it to my colleague um, Carol. To um, um, we have some questions that are she's been tracking in the chat that she'll be asking to you. Well. Um... Hi, Mike. Yes, we do have some questions. And the first question is for NTIA. How can our partners have a voice at the table during the process? Is there a way to provide feedback or get engaged? Yes. Um, so I think, um, so unfortunately, California is not one of my states. And maybe I should have, asked, I should have talked to my FPO before my, I came on here. 
But uh, so I do know that, that there's a regional FPO, which is the federal program officer. Her name is Susan. And so I can make sure that she connects to all these people, right? Um, and then there's a digital equity advisor. There's two of them. There's a, one of my colleagues, Katarina, and then one of my colleagues, um, I think it's Brett. It might be either Brett or Michelle. There's those seven of us digital equity advisors. And our responsibility is to, is to be the ones that connect the dots. So we'll come to your state, to your city, to your town to find out, oh, what's going on there? Okay, well, now let's make sure that you're connected to the state broadband office, right? So that we'll make the connections if need be. Um, and some of that work is taking place. So I guess to answer your question specifically is just to like, let's, let us stay connected and then we'll connect you with the state broadband office if you don't already know who they are, just to make sure that you're in the loop. Because it's, it's important to us that you guys have a seat at the table, right? We don't want, because you're the ones who work with the people who need, who need connections. So it's very important to us that we that, that work is being done. So I'll, I'll leave my information or we can get it from Michael um, to make sure that you are connected to the state broadband office and to the process. Thank you. And we also have a question for Melinda. Uh, Melinda, are there specific types of projects that you're focused on right now with that funding? And um, what are you looking for in upcoming projects? And what partnerships are preferred? What makes them competitive? Wow, okay, that's a lot. Um, so we are always looking for projects that are going to help create um, high-skilled, high-wage jobs. Um, and, and we're also looking for projects in the same vein, along with those jobs being created, we want to grow the private sector. So we're looking for opportunities where the private sector can come in and invest their own money um, into uh, their business, their the buildings, land, things like that. Um, specifically for this year, um, to add to that, it's uh, manufacturing, of course, is a really big thing that we're looking at. Um, manufacturing, of course, is really strong here in California. So uh, we're looking at ways that we can um, build on that. So that could be anything from uh, opening up new industrial parks with uh, additional infrastructure. You know, it could be doing uh, business incubators that are focused on um, manufacturing. Uh, the innovation again is very important into that. So that, you know, developing new products so they can be manufactured here um in the states uh, other things priorities it goes along with this um, exports because we want to sell u.s products to the world and we also want foreign direct investment which is where we're getting foreign companies to come and invest here um, in the states the california has always been really strong one of the leaders in in foreign direct investment fdi um, slowed down a lot during the pandemic, but I expect that it's going to start picking up again. Um, it is, it's, it's, it's a great way to infuse new capital into a market. Uh, other things that are important, we recognize that workforce development, making sure that the local workforce is, uh, has the, excuse me, the skills to um, meet the demands of the employers in a community, especially with new employers or new industry sectors growing. Um, so I, I must add here that uh, because we do have a Department of Labor, uh, they are responsible for the soft side of workforce development, the curriculum development, the actual training where our focus is for workforce development is on facilities and specialized equipment, which are things that Department of Labor doesn't have the authority to spend on. So uh, we're always looking for good uh, workforce development projects. Um, and of course, you know, to tie all of that together, uh, we want these projects to benefit our uh, uh, disadvantaged communities, our economically distressed communities. So equity um, is our most important priority, um, but it's equity uh, focused on uh, job growth, workforce development, 
and making sure that everyone has the opportunity for that American dream uh, that we've, you know, all bought into all these years. Um, so I think that's it. I think I got it all. Um, thank you for the question. It's a very important question. Thank you, Melinda. Um, Michael, I'm gonna pass it back to you. And I'm gonna um, take the time to just thank both of our panelists. Um, I think that um, at least for myself and I'm sure for the, the rest of the attendees, you know, the information you've given is really timely. Um, I, I wanna give a, just a minute to see if there are any final questions um, before we pivot to our partners at the state. Um, and if you do have questions after we do transition, uh, you can go ahead and put those in the chat and we'll make sure we get those out to our partners at NTIA and also EDA. Um, I don't see. Can I say one more thing before we close out, Michael? Yes. One thing I, I did want to mention is that um, because it's a five-year plan, the goal is to, it's a five-year goal. So one other way to think through it is like in your area, how can you develop a five-year plan for your locality or develop coalitions that could develop a five-year plan to ensure that the areas that, that that area is going to be connected so that that could be funneled up into the larger statewide five-year plan. Um, additionally, I know I saw in the chat about Connect Home USA and public housing authorities. And I did want to say that um, housing authorities could also be sub-grantees and um, administering, administering entities so um, there's, there's an opportunity for them to also receive funds and do the work um, that is connecting people and ensuring that they have digital activity, I mean, digital skills, devices, and et cetera. Um, so, and I'll share the slide deck, like I said, I've shared it with Michael to ensure that you have more information and my contact, contact information, but I didn't want to, us to leave without me sharing those things. Great. Um, let's see. Any other, I don't see any hands raised or any other questions. Um, Michael, can we use the time that we have to give um, knowledge a little um, space to talk about the affordable connectivity grants? Well, I'll just say this. Um, so the AC, the, the affordable connectivity grants. So I'll just say this: they, that's like FCC program, um, and we're not really. I'm not really qualified to speak on another agency's uh, program. That's the only issue. So I mean, I think that you would. I would only encourage you to reach out to the FCC for more information about the um, those grants. I heard a little bit about it, but I'm not qualified to like actually expound upon it. I apologize. And knowledge build, there are some, um, aren't there links um, that would lead to that FCC information? Uh, yes, I, I do have some links that could um, pass on some information about that, yes. Great, thank you. Uh, any other questions? If not, Let's go ahead. I know I'm going to go ahead and pass it back to Danette. I know we we have a little bit of time, but I'm sure we'll we'll take advantage of those or or back to folks. But um, let's go ahead and uh, pass it back to. Am I passing it back to you, Danette, or over to Mark? Oh, thank you. You can pass. We're going to just move on to Mark. Thank you so much, Michael, for the sharing and coordinating that camp, that panel, and thank you also to our federal partners for being here to share their information. We'll also be sharing links and contact information um, as a follow-up to this event. And we'll now turn it over to the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Opportunity. Thank you, Danette. Raquel, if you please could highlight myself, Scott Adams, Miriam Tasnif Abasi, and Alejandro Regosa. Excellent, two out of three, all right, all here. Um, thank you very much, Michael, and thank you very much to our federal partners for describing some of the programs that you have on broadband, digital equity, and um, 
related to the Economic Development Administration and ways that you're working with our communities to um, to uplift our, our economies, um, especially those in distressed communities. Um, on this program, we wanted to focus on, you know, programs or resources for underserved communities. Um, for myself, I felt like it was, you know, a little broad. So uh, uh, in it, the state of California, every single one of our departments underlying has equity uh, as one of our leading principles. Um, but, you know, what I, I um, who I wanted to bring in, as I've heard time and time again from our Promise Zone partners, is you know they want to learn more about getting broadband to their communities. In addition, I wanted to bring in DTSC to talk about some you know they, what they have is unprecedented funding at the state and federal level for brownfields cleanup. So we'll learn more about that, and also Alejandro Dragosa to talk about some grants specifically targeted towards what California has defined as disadvantaged communities. Um, so I'd like to, um, for each one of my panelists, spend 30 seconds or so describing, you know, um, introducing yourself, what you do in your organization um, and what your role is. Let's go with Scott, Miriam, and then Alejandro. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, Mark. And thank you to the, uh, folks on the call here, it's a real privilege to, um, to learn more about your work and how the state's efforts can um, align and, and, and really, uh, um, you know, connect to those efforts. And so my name is Scott Adams. I'm the Deputy Director of Broadband and Digital Literacy um, within the Department of Technology. And um, we are the state's uh, broadband office. So it's my pleasure to be able to um, come and answer some of the questions that were asked in the, the, the previous effort. Um, just real quickly, our office is charged with uh, managing and interacting with the ecosystem of, of individuals and entities working to close the state's digital divide. We coordinate um, the state's broadband for all efforts through the multi-agency California Broadband Council. We are charged with implementing and overseeing the completion of the governor's broadband executive order in the state's broadband action plan. And in the last year and a half, we've been charged with um, developing a, a 10,000 mile open access middle mile network that will um, hopefully connect uh, all of the un and underserved communities and anchor institutions throughout the state when completed. And um, as uh, Mr. Hudson had said, we are uh, charged with developing the state's digital equity plan over the next year. And we're gonna be really happy to speak to you about um, you know, how we hope to partner with all of you on its development. Thank you, Scott. Mm -hmm. Mary? Hey, good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for having me on this panel today. I've already learned so much. It's quite exciting for me as well to be here. Um, my name is Miriam Tassif Abbasi. Um, I'm with the California Environmental Protection Agencies. Department of Toxic Substances Control, uh, government agencies, they don't think about introductions when they decide to like name the organizations. So I do apologize for that mouthful. Um, I'm the Brownfield Development Manager. I manage our office of Brownfields. We have a lot of tools and incentives um, that we have to turn property around and bring it up to higher and better uses. And that's really our focus. The program that Mark talked about is the Equitable Community Revitalization Grant. Last year, we were really, really lucky to get a very large infusion, $260, $270 million actually, to give out in grants for assessments, for investigations, and to clean up um, brownfield properties. And um, we just completed round one earlier this uh, calendar year, and we are out on the road trying to draw attention and get people to come and apply and get ready to apply for uh, round two uh, with $100 million available this year on the table for or focus on disadvantaged communities. So I'm really excited to be able to um, hopefully share in more detail some of that information with you today. Thanks, Mark. Thank you, Mary. Mm -hmm. Alejandro? There you go. Perfect. Thank you guys for, for having us. Uh, we're happy to share about our programs. Um, I am a grant specialist. My name is Alejandro Raigosa and I work for the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development, specifically for uh, community, uh, the local and community grants unit. So we have two different programs, uh, both geared towards um, 
solving some issues regarding equity specifically, um, trying to remedy some of the issues that were created by federal and state policies on the war on drugs. So a lot of the funding that we have available is to, to help uh, those communities that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Um, one source of funding is being used to serve um, local, local jurisdictions, you know, cities, counties, and the other is primarily used for community-based nonprofits, though local health departments can apply as well. And I'll provide more, more information during our panel. Great, thank you. So first I'm gonna get into some questions, um, kind of digging into the specifics of your programs. Um, and then, you know, later on we'll, we'll, you know, ask you some questions about how these organizations can get involved. So for first one, um, I'll go to Miriam with DTSC. So in the past year, as we've mentioned, the state and federal government have announced and program unparalleled investments in brownfield cleanup. I'd love to hear about DTSC's role in helping communities with community revitalization efforts. And please tell us what kinds of activities are eligible under your grant programs and what types of projects your team is looking to fund. Sure, um, absolutely. So um, I'm gonna step back a little bit and, and, and talk to everybody today about what, how we're defining brownfields. Um, there's a lot of confusion on what brownfields are. For us, the official definition is any site whose use or reuse is made complicated by real or perceived contamination. And that's a definition you know, we've used for the past, I think, 15 years. What we're pivoting towards is looking at that a little bit differently. What we like to say is that brownfields are any property where, where investment and resources can turn that land around and make it viable for the community, you know, for that space. And to us, that's something that we are really trying to, to kind of help define people's thoughts on brownfields. Um, we are a regulatory agency and we understand that that sometimes scares people. So we really think about it this way. When we talk about brownfields and we want you to use our funding and our resources for brownfields, um, especially when we're working with disadvantaged and, and underserved communities, we're not looking to turn you in. We're looking to have you turn these plans around and make them viable and useful for your communities again. And so um, our entire equitable community revitalization grant, which is available to public entities, nonprofits and tribes to conduct assessments, environmental investigations or environmental cleanup, um, we're focused in disadvantaged communities. We measure uh, disadvantaged communities or map it out based on a database called Cal and Bioscreen, which gives a score based on the intersection of vulnerable demographics um, with pollution burdens. And the higher the score, the more vulnerable that community is. And so we give a lot of um, point advantages in our process to sites um, that are physically located in those communities. In addition, we also look at projects uh, that may be outside of those high score areas, but are providing um, after the property is made ready for reuse, uh, providing uses that are focused um, on a vulnerable community or a vulnerable population. And so in our last, in our last round, we had about 75 million that were allocated to a number of projects. We had um, affordable housing, uh, we had parks, we had services that were designed for unhoused and underhoused populations, um, health services, bright fields. So we, we brought in a lot of projects that when our work was done, the cleanup or the investigation, the plans to turn those around to viable community uses, um, you know, very exciting, very exciting for us. In round two, um, which we're starting the effort in terms of um, outreach right now and getting people prepped and ready, uh, the application itself is going to open up in um, January, but we're putting a lot of resources, free technical assistance out there for people who are interested. We're looking to expand our geographical footprint. We're looking to get in um, the San Diego area, which we weren't in before, the Inland Empire. So we saw very little representation. We're well represented in the urban 
Northern California, Los Angeles and greater Los Angeles or like San Francisco, Oakland um, areas, we saw a lot of concentrations, but we, we need to expand our geographic footprint. Um, we're looking for projects where our money is really needed, where without um, a grant, you know, we, our cleanup grants are up to $3 million. Our, uh, our investigation grants are up to $3 million and our cleanup grants are up to $7 million. And so, you know, we're looking for projects that really need this money where oftentimes in the history of working for DTSC, I've seen that um, nonprofits and public agencies will invest a lot of money in the cleanup because they want to make the land safe. But after that, they don't have the capacity to get more money now to do what's needed to do to bring the property to, to, to reuse, because that takes a lot of resources. And so what we're hoping is that we're looking for communities that need our money. Um, we're providing free technical assistance, a lot of um, information we're gonna be developing, free webinars, um, one pagers, lists of documents that are gonna be needed because when our application opens up in January, we have a really small window, January through March to get those applications loaded. Um, it's an online application portal and, and we understand it takes a lot. And so we're really trying to um, garner interest and work with people um, to get them ready before the application opens up. So when that application opens up, you're primed. You've got all the documents you need. You need. You've done your eligibility check, uh, self check, and you know generally what you're going to be presenting. And we've got a tremendous amount of resources available um, to help these communities do that. We recognize that it's not enough to say, "Hey, we've got this money. You're a disadvantaged community. You need to apply." Uh, we want to kind of get on the ground and help you develop those stories and develop those narratives that are going to be helpful. We, we're even working with some communities with really basic things where they say, listen, we're interested in your money, but we don't know if we have sites. Can you help us find sites? And so we have the experts who can even get uh, down and work with you on that granular level to see if you have something that can work in this program. And so I, I know it's a lot of information that I threw at you. Um, I did send us our, um, uh, uh our, our website so you can like uh get more information and i invite all of you to join in on our uh easier genius webinars uh that are going on i think every week and the recorded sessions are available for everybody else that's great thank you mary that was a very very thorough uh excellent response um just didn't want you to creep too much into my next question that i have for you uh, next question i'll i'll go with scott um so it was great that we got to hear from NTIA to describe at the federal level what they're doing to bridge the digital um, divide. So uh, as, as we've learned in recent years and exacerbated by the pandemic, having access to reliable internet and devices is critical to participating in modern so society and economy. Um, also, we learned that unfortunately, not all communities have equal access to this essential service. Can you please describe the state's role in ensuring California has a more equitable broadband ecosystem and what are the planned implementation actions? Yeah, certainly, thank you. And um, definitely come as no surprise to the, to the folks on this call as we all live through it. But um, as some of the previous uh, speakers had indicated, Californians' ability to access and use broadband is the difference between uh, being able to fully engage in life and being cut off. Um, I wanted to, to, to point out some, some of the statewide statistics that, um, you know, there's been a persistent digital divide in the state, but it was really amplified and exacerbated by COVID. Um, you know, from a state perspective, 83% of Californians have access to broadband, but only 52% have modern speeds of uh, 100 megabits or more. 51% of rural households have no network offerings. 28% um, of travel lands lack service at that level. And then um, just across the state and in so many communities, millions lack the necessary service devices and skills necessary um, to access essential services and realize other social and economic benefits. And so um, really the, the state's focus and where we come together and where our office is um, coordinating efforts is acknowledging that access, affordability, adoption, and digital literacy and inclusion are critical components of, of digital equity. 
And what that looks like from a, a state perspective is that um, historically, prior to the pandemic, the Broadband Council had really been the, the central um, you know, collaborative body that coordinated the state's efforts around broadband deployment of infrastructure and adoption of services. Um, during the pandemic, the governor issued an executive order that uh, really refocused the, the efforts of the Broadband Council um, and, uh, you know, ordered the Broadband Council to develop a statewide broadband action plan, which they did in about uh, four months during the pandemic. And that, um, was uh, uh, enacted in December of 2020. And that had uh, 20 specific actions related to um, improving um, policy processes, um, uh, creating structures for uh, multi-level stakeholder engagement, identifying funding to support uh, broadband for all and, and improving the state's mapping and, and other uh, uh, efforts to support broadband. And I wanna note that the the, that the goals of Broadband for All are that um, every home, school, and business in the state have access to high-performance broadband. And the, the second goal is that all residents have access to affordable service and devices to um, you know, participate in, and interact with the internet. And then lastly, that residents have um, you know, pathways to receive the training skills that they need to um, you know, succeed and advance um, both in their educational and career and, and other life outcomes. And so um, in July of, of 2021, the legislature and the governor passed the historic legislation, Senate Bill 156, which allocated $6 billion of mostly um, ARPA funding and some capital project fund dollars to um, fund missing middle and last mile infrastructure throughout the state. And $3.25 billion of those funds went to the Department of Technology and the department and our office is charged with overseeing the development of a 10,000 mile <laughs> open access uh, uh, middle mile network. Um, it really spans the state. It goes through all counties and most communities. and. What that would do is um, offset the, the, the cost model that has prevented existing providers from um, building out service. It would um, allow new entrants and uh, other entities to uh, build their own last mile solutions. So that's on the middle mile side. And the, uh, an additional $2.75 billion was allocated to the Public Utilities Commission to either enhance existing last mile uh, and uh, broadband adoption programs or create new programs to support last mile initiatives. So from an SB 156 standpoint, you've got two efforts where the, the middle mile is being built. It's on a very tight timeline. Uh, the entire project has to be contracted by 2024 and um, completed by December of 2026. Um, similarly, the PUC is, is developing and gone out with a lot of their programs that are available um, to entities here that um, would support communities in, in developing last mile solutions as the middle miles being built so that they can connect together. Um, the last thing that I would mention is, is as Mr. Um, Hudson said earlier, um, we're really excited about leveraging the, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act um, funding. The, uh, the Department of Technology is going to be leading the development of the state digital equity plan over the next year and um, you know with the planning grant from the NTIA what's exciting is um, it's it going to create a, a, a new era of collaboration between the state and local and regional entities and we're really excited about working together with all of you to identify the barriers for the eight covered populations and, and specifically identifying how um, you know we can create solutions to empower other um, outcomes, including education and access to health, um, workforce development, digital inclusion, tribal outcomes, et cetera. Um, I could keep going, but I'm going to keep my comments brief. Um, I will say that we're uh, fully leveraging the Affordable Connectivity Program, and I'd be happy to answer any questions about um, what the state's doing to promote that as well. Great. Thank you, Scott. So you said $6 billion with a B. 
Do you know off the top of your head what what this is in mag magnitude to other state historical state funding and broadband? Or is this something um, you have to dig into? Sorry, I don't have spot. to dig into it. I think that okay. California was a little bit ahead of the curve in that, um, you know, uh, this governor and this legislature saw an opportunity to, you know, both meet the moment and build back better and leverage those federal dollars to, um, you know, in a state like California really set us up for the next century with improved broadband infrastructure. And so um, I do know that the, the, the middle mile will be the, the largest, um, you know, publicly owned middle mile network in, in the nation, if not the world. And um, the investments are quite significant. And that's just given the, 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 both the population and the geography of California, that's the kind of funding that's required. Great, thank you. That's great to hear. All right, uh, next question for Alejandro. So your unit, the Community and Local Equity Grants Unit, focuses on administering grants to help communities and populations that have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. Can you please describe the programs you oversee, including the types of activities funded and eligible organizations? Absolutely, so as, as I mentioned in the beginning, we have two programs in our unit of grants programs, one geared towards of local jurisdictions um, to support their um, equity efforts to remove um, or reduce barriers to entry into the legal cannabis market. And then on the other hand, we have uh, the Community Investment Grants Program, which um, is um, service-based. We provide funding to community-based nonprofits and local health departments, which in turn um, serve communities that have been disproportionately impacted by by the war on drugs in six different categories. Um, that is job placement, mental health treatment, substance use disorder, legal barriers, so providing legal services to remove barriers to re-entry. When we have individuals that have been just, you know, formerly incarcerated that one are coming back into the community. So the legal services are geared towards those individuals. Then we have system navigation services, um, helping uh, community members know what services are available in their communities and connect with them. And then lastly, link just to medical care, which um, of note, it, we, we fund the, the linkage, uh, not the medical service itself. So we help community members be linked to, to medical services that they may need. So that's, that's the main difference between uh, both programs. We both um, are trying to remedy some of the impacts by the war on drugs, one of them, is, is being implemented by local jurisdictions, cities and counties to which we provide funding. And on the other program, you know, we provide this funding to community-based nonprofits and local health departments. Um, in the three cycles that we've done so far, the vast majority of applicants have been community-based nonprofits, but there is funding allocated also for local, local health departments. Great, thank you Alejandro. Um, can you provide any examples? So for, I think, for the Promise Zone organizations and their partner organizations, they partner with many um, nonprofits within their communities. Uh, can you give examples of specific types of uh, grant awardees or projects that have been funded You with that kind of the, the nonprofit half, the nonprofit component? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, we really have like interest from nonprofits from different parts of the states, all over, all over the states actually, and um, and also different types of services, right? As I mentioned before, I think I'm gonna repeat it because it's important. So the six funding categories are job placement, mental health treatment, substance use disorder treatment, legal services to remove barriers to reentry system navigation services, and then linkages to medical care, right? So if you are a community-based nonprofit that has um, the, that has a status at the state and federal level, you can, you may apply to us. And we have like uh, an example of a recent organization that we have funded is an organization providing, you know, job placement, but also uh, connecting um, individuals in the community to services that may be available in that community, right? And specifically, they provide workforce development training uh, to eventually get jobs in the solar industry. So they, they get these individuals 
many of them that are perhaps like former gang members or have been previously incarcerated or otherwise have been disproportionately impacted by the war on drugs. And they put them through this um, um, 12 week program, 12, 16 week program um, in different cohorts. And, and, and then eventually that leads into job placement in the solar industry, right? All of that being done while the, the individual is um, served holistically, right? Because one of our principles is whole person care and trauma-informed care. So as the individual is getting workforce development training, they're also uh, maybe receiving um, mental health treatment via group sessions, you know, peer group um, sessions, maybe one-on-one -on -one with, a, with a therapist. They may also have um, a community uh, community worker that is assessing their needs holistically and identifying potential services that they may um, may may use. Um, yeah, so that's one example of of a grantee that we have. Great, thank you, Alejandro. But um, I was, just... you know, one more thing that I just would like to highlight is that there's no there's no criteria that you may have to be serving, you know, in multiple. Um, you know, funding categories. Um, so um, some of our grantees just serve in one of the funding categories, um, though, you know, the majority of things they, they, they tend to, to select, you know, two or more. Got it. Thank you. Um, just as a time check for our panelists, we have about uh, 10 to 15 minutes left to um, address the next question or two that I'm going to be asking for each of you. I'll start with Miriam. Um, so how may how might community or sorry promise zone organizations and their partners get engaged to participate in the um, uh, ECRG or other programs oversought by DTSC? Um, what type of partnerships might you be looking for in your application process? Um, also, what types of technical resources? You've touched on them a little bit, but technical resources available to them? Sure. Uh, thank you, Mark. So. Um... We, as I mentioned, want to get into different geographies. For us, all the partnerships that make sense for our um, ECRG would be any partnership that's revolved around the use of land. So if you have, there's different ways of looking at it. If you have a project that's already in mind that exists within your promise zone, um, if you can like mobilize the parties um, that are, you know, maybe it's the city, maybe it's a nonprofit that would like um, to have us invest uh, in the investigation or cleanup, you know, set up a conversation with us so we can understand what kind of application would make sense and would be competitive. We see a lot of public private partnerships. We see um, public uh, partnerships with, you know, multiple different um, stakeholders. So in the end, you have to decide who is going to be the applicant. I'm not sure how the promise zones themselves are set up, if they're set up as a separate public entity where they could be an eligible applicant. Um, one of the things that we've seen for some of these umbrella agencies, like I was having a conversation with the Council of Governments yesterday, is that they are interested in learning about brownfields within their um, jurisdiction. And so they're thinking about doing an assessment application where they'll bring in three, four, five sites that they're interested in learning more about and use our money to do very early stage, phase one, phase two, initial environmental assessments to determine if those lands have any brownfields impact. Because if they don't, then you know, you're know you good to go. And if they do, maybe they get um, you know moved in and you can work with us in the future uh, and use our other resources. So I really would consider things either Either you go land first or you go project first. Do you want to build a park? Do you want to build affordable housing and maybe look at it that way? So, you know, we'd have to have specific discussions, but I would encourage everyone to think about um, that kind of visioning for um, the ECRG. And um, as I mentioned before, and as Mark mentioned just now, you know, we we have assistance. So even if you even if you have any sort of vague idea of some land that you think might be contaminated or is thought to be contaminated, come and have that conversation with, with us. Um, and then we can maybe help you come up with some kind of structure that'll make sense. Great, thank you, Miriam. I uh, also just wanted to plug um, one of our attendees or one of uh, an audience member, Michael Huff, 
he has a question whether the funds can be used to um, clean up or, or utilize for urban or urban gardens or farms. Sure, that, that's a really good question. Thank you so much for asking that. So we just provide the funds for the removal of the contamination, right? The investigation and the cleanup. But that reuse is something in our application that scores lots of points. And you know, we like community farms and we like access to healthy foods. So those are the kinds of reuses that will help you score high, especially if there's a need for that in the community. So we do have um, a couple of uh, urban farming projects, I think that came in this time, um, which we're really excited about. So it would, it, would, it would actually tell a strong story and it would help you score high. Great, thank you, Miriam. I'm also going to plug in for you. I know you all have a, an opening right now for a Brownfield Redevelopment Specialist. So if anybody you know out there is looking to join this exciting opportunity, kind of once in a, uh, once in a generation type of funding that's being allocated, uh, please share it with your network. That would be fantastic. Uh, Thanks, Mark, for that plug. Yeah, absolutely. All right, uh, next question. I'll go to Alejandro. Um, so Similarly, how might Promise Zone organizations um, get engaged with your programs? What partnerships might you look for? Um, and what type of technical assistance may be available uh, in this in application process? Absolutely. So um, as of now, our grant solicitation is set up to fund single applicants. So we, we don't accept any collaborations. However, m the vast majority, I would say like, um, all of our grantees have um, informal partnerships or MOUs that you know, are not included in, in the proposal itself. Um, but let's say, for example, if I am a nonprofit that I'm providing job placement in system navigation services, but I want to make sure that my clients you know, or my prior population is served holistically, then I may start trying to do key partnerships, right? Okay, I, I want to partner with an organization that may be strong in providing mental health services, right? The, which is something that I may not be uh, particularly particularly strong at or, or the other funding categories like legal services, right? So having those partnerships in, in place. So when a proposal is submitted um, and, and the story comes across like, hey, you know, like this, these are my strong, so these are my core competencies. Um, however, I already developed partnerships in the community with other community-based nonprofits, with uh, other uh, perhaps government entities, um, that also helps a lot. Now, beyond the service delivery, like specifically if you're serving individuals that have been formerly incarcerated, having, having partnerships with uh, justice-related organizations at the local level also, also helps, right? Perhaps um, that, that supports your application in the sense of I'm going to be serving this, this population, formerly incarcerated individuals. I already have a, um, you know, good connections with local authorities, you know, um, perhaps, you know, actually, in fact, in some circumstances, these community-based nonprofits go into prisons and, and the programming starts there, not even like before, not even, not even after their release. Um, so some of those, those are some of the partnerships that I would be thinking about if I were interested in, in applying in applying to the program. Um, and looking over our grant solicitation, you know, I, I would say, you know, take a good look um, at what our requirements are in specific. I, I just, in general terms, was speaking, um, but the grant solicitation provides, you know, more great detail. And I would like just to highlight four of the, um, of the criteria that sometimes uh, our applicants don't, don't pay too much attention. And then at the end, when they're submitting the application, they realize that they may not be eligible. Um, so they, they have to make sure that they're in good standing with our organization, right? So, so first they need to have an active enlisting with the secretary of state um, and make sure that they're in good standing. Um, also the attorney general's office, you know, Register your charitable trust, um, and the last two is you know being in good standing and having tax exempt status with IRS and FTB. So making sure that you're in good standing with all those four organizations before applying, or as you're you know thinking on your application, um, it's a tremendous help. And when it comes to technical assistance, uh, our staff are 
are ready and they're, we're always answering questions that's via email or, or that if you know we set up a call or a call comes into the main line, um, we're more than happy to answer questions in regards to you know, eligibility or uh, maybe further um, details on questions that may have on unfounded categories and, and all that. Great, thank you Alejandro. And last for Scott, uh, similarly, how can Promise Zones or community-based organizations ensure that uh, you know, your efforts are being deployed equitably across their communities? Uh, well, there's a number of ways, and um, I'm, I'm going to answer part of the question you asked the other folks and wanted to make sure that I sure. highlight that um, uh, I had included in the chat a link to the Public Utilities Commission's uh, broadband implementation page where there's information about uh, last mile grants and programs that are available um, for folks. Um, also wanted to um, draw attention to uh, the Broadband for All portal link that I uh, put into the chat where folks can learn more about the Broadband for All programs and specifically um, find more information on the affordable connectivity program. That's a big um, focus here in California, both the Broadband Council um, and in other partners is leveraging the FCC's $14.2 billion subsidy to make sure that, um, you know, residents and, you know, underserved communities that have access to broadband, but um, for economic reasons choose not to, can leverage that subsidy that in some cases can zero out their service. Um, in terms of, um, you know, the, the part about um, how we're targeting efforts and, and, and um, embedding equity and how folks can participate. Um, we are, uh, the Department of Technology, the Public Utilities Commission and other state agencies are gonna be having a, a broadband for all summit and uh, digital equity and, and be kickoff on Monday, October 24th. It's gonna be a, a four hour virtual summit where um, we're gonna uh, really walk through in detail the components of the digital equity plan and um, the NTI requirements that Mr. Hudson mentioned earlier and uh, how we are seeking to partner and engage with folks at the local level to help uh, co-create and develop the digital equity plan over the next year. And that's gonna be really important that, um, you know, particularly the Promise Zone folks here who are working um, so closely on the ground and know what the needs are, can um, have their voices be heard and not just their voices, but lend their subject matter expertise um, and best practices that um, can inform the digital equity plan, which, um, you know, really exciting once it's done and approved by the NTIA is gonna bring, uh, you know, an additional $100 million to support uh, digital equity programs throughout the state. Great. Thank you so much, Scott. And we have just it time. Perfectly well done. Um, for our state panelists, if you could please add your email into the chat. I know in case in, in, in the event that we weren't able to get to all questions um, asked or if some folks perhaps, you know, didn't feel, um, you know, they, they maybe wanted in more confidence to ask you other questions uh, to give them that opportunity. I'm going to turn it back over to my partners with HUD. Um, again, I appreciate and I thank all my state panelists um, and also again with HUD in this partnership in providing resources to our Promise Zone communities. Thank you. And so again, we wanna thank everyone for joining us today for our panel list from both the federal and state sharing resources with our Promise Zone. We'll be continuing this series. Our next portion of the series will focus on housing. We'll be looking at increasing access to affordable housing. We'll be looking at the issue of home ownership and programs related to home ownership. And then we'll finally be looking at how to address housing discrimination. I see that we do have a question. Julius, I'll go ahead and take that question as we're wrapping up. Go ahead. Yeah, not so much a question, more of a statement. Uh, definitely um, grateful and thankful for these sessions and appreciative of, of hearing about the resources from the uh, personnel that, that are brought to the table. But I want to reiterate that I think it would be uh, 
extremely beneficial and probably greater outcomes could be had if we can provide some opportunities for the federal agencies and the state agencies to uh, directly uh, share information and resources directly to our promise zone partners. Um, uh, even if I had to take on the lead of, of facilitating that and um, hosting that, uh, I, would, I would do so. But I just think that it's one thing for me to hear about a grant opportunity or a NOFO um, and then go and try to tell some partners uh, versus them directly hearing it themselves and having a real time opportunity to pose uh, questions and also establish those relationships with the agencies. Um, so I just wanted to uh, put that back out into the uh, into the air um, uh, with maybe hopes for us maybe setting up uh, a discussion offline uh, about the possibility of either you all making that happen or maybe I could take it on with your support. Sure, so why don't we have that conversation offline. I also wanna to reiterate to everyone that these recordings are available to actually share directly with your partners. I know there is some disadvantage that they can't ask additional questions, but each one of the sessions are available so that they can digest this information in real time. And you can have subsequent conversations about how to utilize that opportunity. But thank you for bringing that to our attention again. It's sort of like, and we can think about it as we transition into the next session. And so I just wanna highlight for everyone, again, that that next session will focus on housing and it's going to cover those three topics that I mentioned before. And if others have feedback about some of the conversations some of the things that Julia shared, please feel free to share that with your community liaison. We'll be regrouping this week to kind of debrief and continue planning for the next session so we can incorporate those concerns and needs into that discussion. And again, um, I wanna just thank everyone for coming here today and joining us. Annette, I just a, one really quick, um, sure. I've shared in the chat, the uh, best opportunities for sharing or, or getting the word on um, updated or new grants at the state and also federal level, uh, at least within the state of California, are the, um, I've, as I've added in the chat, grants.ca.gov. There's a subscribe um, option in which you can kind of filter specifically for types of grant programs that you're looking for. Um, and OPR, Office of Planning and Research in California, they have a team dedicated to helping local communities um, in securing federal grants too. So they also, they too have a subscription. And I, I think that's the best way to share to your partners. And then anything that comes up that they may be interested in and learning more, then that's a way we can make the connection with those relevant state agencies, um, as well as tying back to HUD and, and the, uh, relevant federal agencies. Yeah. Um, hey, Mark, if you don't mind me jumping in too, um, uh, there is a, a broadband uh, funding finder on the, the Broadband for All portal as well. So folks can um, go to the link that we put in there and there's a lot of resources they can connect, um, you know, various entities to, to broadband grants for deployment and adoption as well. And then just in conclusion too, I want everyone to know too that through your community liaison or through connect contacting our panelists directly, we can also set up conversations where people can come and share directly with um, your implementation partners and with your community partners, any opportunities that they're specifically interested in. And again, thank you everyone for joining us today. We'll be sharing some wrap up materials in the weeks to come and then moving on to our next series. Everyone have a great week.